Hello everyone, and welcome back to another GIS lecture video. And in this lecture video, I want to discuss the last and probably arguably the most important way that we can classify map projections, and that's to talk about case. So up to this point, we've talked about class, which has to do with how we shape the developable surface. And we went over the three most common being leaving it as a flat sheet called planar, wrapping it up like a paper towel roll called cylindrical, or making a party hat, which we call the conic. We talked about how we can take those three fundamental shapes and we can sort of rotate them around the earth to either be equatorial or planar depending on if they focus on the equator or the pole. They could be transverse, meaning we rotate them 90 degrees, so they're on their side. Or we talked about how they could be oblique, which was basically anything other than equatorial, polar, or transverse. All right. So <clears throat> the next thing that I want to talk about is called case. And I want to make sure that we have a really good understanding of case because case is actually going to be extremely important when we talk about distortion, which is going to be the topic of the next video. All right. And so what I want to do here is I want to draw a reference globe. And then I want to draw two pieces of a reference globe. So this is the, the entirety. This is sort of a, a small section of it. <clears throat> and what I want to do here is I want to talk about the idea of case being the width or the size of the reference globe or of the, the width or the size of the developable surface relative to the reference globe, right? Now, I'm, I'm using a different set of terminology here. Um, this is sort of a personal definition because I think it, it makes the most logical sense. Um, we'll talk about the more formal definition here in a moment. Right, but with case, what you're doing is it's the size of the developable surface relative to the reference globe. And now, I kind of want to make sure that we're clear on what I mean when I say size. And I want to, again, think about this idea of a cylindrical projection. And I want you to think about the way that we've been talking about it so far, which was that we had the, the, the way that we've been drawing it so far, let me try and keep this a little bit straighter, right, was that it was like a perfect fit, right, that it sort of perfectly encapsulated right <clears throat> the, the reference globe in the sense that and we didn't really make a big note of this but in the sense that it really only ever touches along in this case right this is a equatorial projection Right, and that it only ever really touched at the equator. Now, of course, I've done a really poor job of, of keeping my diagram straight here. Right, but it only ever touched at the equator in the case of the equatorial projection. Right. And so if we were to draw the developable surface on our sort of example here, right, Right. It only ever intersected the Earth in one, in this case, one circle, right? So where the Earth, where the reference globe intersects the developable surface or where the developable surface intersects or touches the reference globe, right? We call this a standard line. Let 
okay? And you want to keep standard line in the back of your head because we're going to be talking about standard lines in the next video when we talk about distortion, right? But again, right, so the idea here is that the way that we've kind of been drawing them by default is that they were almost a perfect fit in that in the case of the equatorial projection, right, it was nestled perfectly so that the only place the developable surface was touching the reference globe was at the equator. Or if we turn this on its side, right, it was only touching the reference globe at some meridian. Right, again, you can think about this as if you were taking that soccer ball and you were wrapping the poster board around the soccer ball, right? This type of scenario would be where the where the where you wrapped it just tight enough that the soccer ball wasn't falling out, right? It was, it was holding the soccer ball in place by touching it at the widest point of the soccer ball, which on the earth would be the equator. Okay. <clears throat> okay. When the size of the reference of the developable surface is such that it only touches the reference globe in one place, right, one line, we call this the tangent case. Right, when the developable surface intersects the reference globe at a single point or in this case right <clears throat> because it's a cylinder right a single line so there's only one point of tangency Right, that's why it's called the tangent case. There's only one point of tangency along <clears throat> the reference globe between the developable surface and the reference globe. Okay, we'll talk about why this is important in the next video. All right, <clears throat> but let's go ahead and scroll down just a little bit and let's go ahead and draw ourselves since I made that a bit of a mess of that. I want to draw another example here. Right. Now, in the real world, right, with with the example of the poster board and the soccer ball, right, the soccer ball was a physical object. Right? You couldn't squeeze harder, right? You have to remember that this is conceptual, right? The reality of this is this is all trigon trigonometry. We're just explaining conceptually um, a way to, way to frame this. And because this is conceptual and imaginary, right, we're not limited to just being able to have it touch once, right? You could imagine taking the taking the poster board, tightening it up so that it's smaller than the soccer ball and shoving it down through the soccer ball, right? And that might look something like this. So you can see we've kind of cored out through the soccer ball. Right. So in this case, right, again, this is our equator here. Right. In this case, what we've done is we've actually created two standard lines, right? Because the, the earth is intersecting, or sorry, not earth, the reference globe is intersecting the developable surface in two places. The first is here, and again, pardon my bad hand, pardon my bad drawing skills here, and the second is here, right? So we now have two standard lines. Right, and so what that would look like from a cut, from a sort of cut perspective, Right, again, this is the cut perspective, right? Oops. Is that it's going to look something like this. I cannot draw to save my life today. It's going to look something like that. 
right, where we have the developable surface interacting in two places, right? And so you can imagine this would be, you know, extending. In directions there right again these are two standard lines so when we have two standard lines right we call this the secant case secant case right the developable surface interacts or intersects I should say not interacts intersects the reference at two points right or put another way it creates two lines okay so this is really important. We're going to come back to this idea of tangent versus secant in the next video when we talk about distortion. The idea here is that what we're doing is we're controlling how many places or how many times the developable surface interacts with the reference globe. In the tangent case, right, we set it up so that it only interacts once. In the secant case, Right, we've shrunk the developable surface or we made the developable surface tighter so that it actually cuts through the reference globe and intersects twice. So hopefully this all makes sense. And as always, if you have any questions, please reach out. Thank you.